I'm Jolene Ivey. I represent District 5 on the Prince George's County Council. I'm running for re-election and you're watching The Soul of the War. Welcome. Thank you so much, Alexis. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to jump right into it. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? How did you grow up? Where did you grow up? So, when talking about like my younger years, mm -hmm. one thing is that my dad was black and mm -hmm. my mom was white. And mm -hmm. they were married in the 50s when it was illegal for them to be married wow. in Maryland or Virginia. Didn't you say this? You didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was illegal for my parents, because of their race, uh -huh. to be married in, in Maryland or Virginia, so they lived in D.C., which is why I grew up in D.C. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as a result of their marriage, who they were, because they both passed since then, um, I look the way I look. Mm -hmm. Now, I was raised by my dad, who was African-American, in Northeast D.C. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about me that feels anything but black. Yes. And so I know what I look like, mm -hmm. and I guess I have, you know, enough of my mom's genes that yeah. people get confused and they think I'm white when I'm just black to me. Mm -hmm. And so um, in any event, that's had an impact on me politically yeah. because I think that, you know, you have to be practical. When people are voting, they want to, every time somebody says, we want someone who looks like us, I'm like, well, how about me? <laughs> I don't look like <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're 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 one hundred percent right, and thank you for just being open to willing even say that on the record because I think that a lot of women deal with that. You know, I deal with that. Yeah. So you know, I you look perfect. What do you mean you deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, it's it's a thing. You know, color colorism is very right. real, and yeah. um. Yeah, so thank you for being transparent in that aspect and definitely keep a lookout in supporting other, you know, especially minority women, supporting mm -hmm. all of us uh, when it comes to being on the, t the right minority women. And yes. you are the right minority women. I appreciate because that. Because I do think that a lot of times, you know, we do have to recognize all skin folk and kin folk. And just Bam. because, you know, they look like you doesn't mean that they're for you. Right. Well, I grew up in Northeast D.C. from the time I was born until I was 15. And um, at that point, my family moved to Kettering. Mm -hmm. And I finished school not at Largo, which was the school I would be assigned to, mm -hmm. but my father taught at High Point High School. Mm -hmm. So I took horticulture so I could have a transfer mm -hmm. into High Point. I attended High Point High School. Nice, wow, yeah. okay. So you might as well just say, you know, PG. Oh, but, yeah, but <laughs> all the way. All the way, right? All the way. You know, even Northeast D.C., I mean, really, you just walk across the street. Absolutely. And you're in the county. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a very fluid area. One of my best friends lived on the Prince George's side, and we didn't think of it as anything. You just cross <laughs> an Eastern Avenue. What's the big deal? Yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. And I think that we still see a lot of that today, especially when mm -hmm. it comes to, like, different crime in the area and mm -hmm. the need to work together when it comes to community service mm -hmm. and servicing the people in this area. No, absolutely. Um, so are you a person of faith? I am. I um, accepted Christ when I was about 12 or so. Mm -hmm. And I think that my faith journey has been maybe bumpy at times, but it's never been severed. Amen. Yeah. Of course. I mean, that's with everyone. Yeah. Um, but how would you say has your faith influenced you into becoming the woman that you are today with so much influence and power within the county? Well, I don't know that I see myself <laughs> that way. <laughs> but I think that the important thing about my faith is it's helped me, like, try to be a good mother to my children, mm -hmm. try to be kind to my neighbors, mm -hmm. and try to see beyond myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people have so much need, and it can't just be about what you need and what you want. It's got to be what the community needs and wants. And mm -hmm. I, I try to do that. I'm certainly not Christ-like, mm -hmm. but that was his example to us. Amen. And so, you know, I do what I can <laughs> to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but I certainly fall short. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Amen. Thank you for your transparency and mm -hmm. honesty in that. Um, how did you get involved in politics? You know, it's a weird thing. When uh, Jesse Jackson ran for president the first time, 
I was, I just had some free time in, on my hands then. I, I had a job, but it wasn't like a job that took a lot of mental energy. Mm -hmm. And I just got super excited about his campaign. I started volunteering. Wow. I was um, in the downtown DC office where mm -hmm. I did very important things like answer the phone and go get hot cocoa or <laughs> whatever they wanted. Uh -huh. And uh, I really loved helping in that way. And it was an exciting um, place to be. Mm -hmm. And then later, I ended up working for then Congressman Ben Cardin as his press secretary. Wow. And I um, really enjoyed that. And I just saw what you could do with an office like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that having those kinds of positions, that like seats at the table, mm -hmm. has been important. And then when I married Glenn, I remember the day he said, you know, I think I'm going to run for state's attorney. I was like, what's that? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I was so puzzled by it. But, you know, he got into it. Therefore, I got into it. And, you know, the whole family helped. And to see him do such a great job, and he's such an extremely ethical person, mm -hmm. sometimes to the point of pain. <laughs> like, he got really mad at me for fighting a traffic ticket. I got a speeding ticket, and I'm like, I'm going to court. He's like, you know you did it. Just pay for it. I'm like, I'm not paying. I'm going. I'm going to fight it. And I won. And he was so mad at me. He what? was still bring it up. Like, why'd wow. you do that? Yeah. Yeah, because if I did something illegal, Glenn would turn me in. 100%. What? I've got no doubt. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. No doubt. I mean, that honestly, that's very, um, I would say, inspiring to hear because you really don't hear about a lot of people like that. Especially, Being that ethical. Yeah, that yeah it's ethical. annoying. It's <laughs> What would you say, this kind of leads me into my next question, what would you say like family life is like with so many of you involved in politics? Um, I know we were talking a little bit off camera. How, how, how is family life like? You know, we all support each other, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So when Julian was, was um, auditioning for plays and, and different acting jobs, we all pitched in to help, to support. Sometimes a bunch of us would have to drive together to some audition because they were too little to be left at home alone. Mm -hmm. So all the kids got dragged around. And then, um, you know, sometimes Glenn would be the one to take them to New York or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So we all help, uh, no matter what each other is doing. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody's running for office, everybody helps. Mm -hmm. It really helps a lot at election time mm -hmm. because you have a team of people who you can rely on mm -hmm. to knock on doors, to work a poll. You know, the early voting is a long time to mm -hmm. have to cover polls for, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of people between our own family. Now a couple of them have gotten married, yay, to the new <laughs> brides who will also have to work a poll. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, the new brides has been coming in to work on Glenn's campaign right now. Uh -huh. she, she works Thursdays in his campaign office, mm -hmm. so she holds it down. And what is Glenn running for? Glenn's running for Congress for, for Congressional District 4. Anthony Brown is mm -hmm. running for Attorney General, so mm -hmm. his seat is open. Mm -hmm. And Glenn announced that he's running for it. He ran once before mm -hmm. against Anthony Brown. Anthony won but not by a ton. Mm -hmm. And so um, coming in second at that, in that race means he's in pretty good shape to run and mm -hmm. become in first place this time. Wow. So we're excited. But everybody's helping, and that's how it works. It's hard to, to cover a bunch of polls mm -hmm. on Election Day. And in our house, everybody's covering a poll from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. <laughs> The end. Awesome. There's no discussion. Nobody even complains because you accept that this is your life. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, when... Uh, five know, kids, five boys, it works. <laughs> <laughs> when, I was, um, when I was being raised, you know, I was raised by my father. Um, one of the rules we had in our household was everybody gets up Sunday morning, clean up. That's the rule. Saturday yeah. morning, clean right. up. Right. And... Um, if only we had that opportunity to, you know, have poll workers at the polls. And, there you go. Yeah, that's, it's honestly a blessing. So You know, my dad um, was a single father as well for a while. Mm -hmm. When um, I was three and my brother was six, our mom left mm -hmm. and our dad raised us. And um, he did a great job. And when I was almost seven, he remarried mm -hmm. and um, to our stepmother, Genevieve, we called her Gigi. Mm -hmm. 
and you know they had a, a long and, and great marriage awesome. so yeah I was looking at some pictures this morning they were married um, boy now I can't remember how many years but I know it was over 30 mm -hmm. because we gave them a party for their 30th and I was looking at the 30th anniversary pictures that's awesome yeah I, I mean I definitely think that single fathers do not get the recognition that they deserve no they work mm -mm. so hard right and they are highly um, unappreciated so they're kind segment. of they, it's Thank like they're they're disappear they're 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 like vi invisible yeah yeah but, um, what's some advice that you can give other women looking to get involved in politics? What challenges have you dealt with being a woman in politics? You know, when I ran for delegate the mm -hmm. first time, and it kind of came out of the blue. Nobody saw it coming, in, including me. Mm -hmm. In fact, Rashawn Baker is the person who suggested that I run. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Glenn about it, who was not less than enthusiastic at first. But, you know, the more we talked about it, the more he warmed up to it, and then he came fully on board and has been number one supporter. But when I would go out door knocking or go to community meetings, the people I would hear negative things from were older women. Mm. And they would say to me, well, what about your kids? How, how mm. are you going to do this? If, what about your kids? You have all these kids at home. Mm. And I said, well, you never said anything to Glenn about that <laughs> because my husband had already been elected and been uh -huh. serving and he had the same children and they never said a word. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah I kind of shut him up. Yeah. Keep them on your own business. My kids are fine. Thank you very much. Respect. 100%. <laughs> so just, I would say my advice would be to be um, independent and sure of what you want to do and do it. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is to figure out how you're going to finance it because it's expensive to run for office. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you should reach into your own pocket. I'm a strong believer. Um, the agreement that Glenn and I have made with each other mm -hmm. is that if you can't raise the money for it, then you can't run for it. Nice. The end. Y'all, that was some advice for me, okay? <laughs> that was definitely advice for me because after my campaign, I was broke. See? Okay. <laughs> Can't do that. Yes. So thank you for that advice. No, you got you got to raise the money, and you got to have people you can go to. And mm -hmm. people out there, you need to invest in candidates. You need to help women or whoever you're supporting. Mm -hmm. You got to help them run. Definitely, definitely. That's a huge piece because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know how big donations really are. Right. So right. thank you for that. We're going to jump into some uh, policy questions. Um, what is your take on the legalization of marijuana? I support that. Mm -hmm. um, I actually was able to vote for the um, decriminalization of marijuana and for medical awesome. cannabis when I was in the House of Delegates. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and I felt good about both of those votes. I do think we've gotten to the point it's going to be easier in our society if it's just legalized mm -hmm. because it's hard for people, even if you are legally taking it because you have some medical condition mm -hmm. but then you have to pee in a cup for some job mm -hmm. and they tell you oh now you're you can't get the job you're disqualified mm -hmm. there's something wrong with that yeah so I think that just to take all the fuzz out of it just make it legal and move on with your lives mm -hmm. what, what are some ways though uh, with the legalization of it that we can protect our kids because I know that you you probably saw that story about the kids with the edibles in school and then mm. they had um, to have be treated on the scene. Sure. Or I mean, this is I 100% agree with everything you said about the mm -hmm. legalization of marijuana. Mm -hmm. I think it is time, mm -hmm. but I think that we also need to have that conversation on protecting the children. So, you know, that's true on many different things like alcohol. And but in addition to that, people need to lock up firearms mm. because I think that's way more dangerous mm -hmm. and we keep ha hearing about kids sometimes a two-year-old you yes. know getting access to a weapon shooting their mother by mistake yes. or whatever their 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 brother or sister mm -hmm. I mean things happen and they can't happen unless parents or you know adults are being irresponsible mm -hmm. so we all need to be more responsible no matter mm -hmm. what around children and make sure things are locked up and put away is there any policy uh, surrounding when you do purchase a weapon that you have to have it yeah there is policy like you have to have a specific there are already laws there but people mm -hmm. have to follow the law mm -hmm. is the problem 
I'd be more for just getting rid of guns personally. I'm mm -hmm. just not for guns at all. I mm -hmm. think they shouldn't exist in our society, but I'd, mm -hmm. obviously that, that horse is out of the barn. Mm -hmm. So um, therefore, we have to deal with the reality that guns are in our community and they're in people's homes. Yeah. Uh, and where are they? And are people being responsible? And if they're not, what are the consequences? Mm -hmm. So, Do you... Um in doing some research on you, are you still a part of the Mental Health Advisory Board? I am part of it, but quite frankly, it hasn't met since the pandemic hit, and oh. I was only named to it just before, mm -hmm. so I haven't had an opportunity to, um, to be a part of it, really. Mm -hmm. um, I have been very supportive of NAMI, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know, an organization that the community has that is very involved with mental health. Mm -hmm. And so I've gone to some of their meetings, mm -hmm. um, and I think they do an amazing job. Do you have any um, initiatives when the board does uh, meet to address mental health surrounding marijuana, um, specifically like marijuana psychosis, mm -hmm. um, that are going to continue to be on the rise if marijuana is legalized? You know, that's not something I can say that I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. so I'd have to learn more about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the mental health problems I know about are more the ones that are more typical. Um, people who are having some kind of mental breakdown problem mm -hmm. and they end up in the hands of the police and mm -hmm. then what happens next. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that the police are trained and how to deal with them mm -hmm. and we should have policies in place that bring um, teams of people who are trained to deal with someone in a mental health crisis mm -hmm. instead of, uh, I, I went personally to a friend's house whose son was having a problem and the police came and he ended up being tased and arrested and wow. taken to the hospital and he was, um, you know, had to be there for a few days and he had legal problems for quite some while. But mm -hmm. the good news is that he went through the mental health court mm -hmm. that our county has and as a result he came out on the other end of it okay, mm -hmm. but he still is struggling with some mental health issues mm -hmm. and is living in a group home now. Wow. Yeah, but we need to do um, all we can to help people struggling because mental health illness is, you know, that kind of illness is just as serious as cancer or any it other is. physical. It is. But we just don't understand it as well or know yes. how to deal with it. Yes, yes. Thank you for yeah. that, for sharing that story mm -hmm. with me. I mean, I have members in my family that deal with mental illness as well. Yeah. And it's, it's extremely difficult on the family, mm -hmm. but it's also, I think, you know, coming from a black family, it took us a while to even recognize it. So, mm -hmm. you know, just having that, like, information out there and available and having that, I, I can't say that we would have even still recognized it if the conversation of mental health was not so right. prevalent, prevalent now. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for that. Um, can you explain to our audience the controversy behind the redistricting plan that just passed? You know, Alexis, I think the biggest problem with the redistricting plan was a lack of communication, mm -hmm. where there was, um, I'd been led to believe all along that the, that the redistricting commission was working on it. Um, one of the people who I work with on the council, Tom Dernoga, mm -hmm. had been our little group's like person to go to those meetings, mm -hmm. listen in, find out what was going on, report back. Everything seemed fine. My flags weren't raised until the day of the first vote mm -hmm. when council member Derek Leon Davis presented his map. Mm -hmm. And um, there was an amendment a few days later to sort of satisfy, but not really, <laughs> the University of Maryland that had some concerns. Mm -hmm. um, that was put in by Mel Franklin. and. I just didn't like the way it was done, the way it was communicated. I don't like the map. Mm -hmm. I don't really don't like the way it impacted um, people who are planning to run for mm -hmm. office. They were suddenly moved out of the area that they were running in. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I thought it was undemocratic. But mm -hmm. you know what? I'm putting that behind me. Mm -hmm. I represent most of the same district. I'll have some new parts. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have to you know, regroup to a, a, a certain extent mm -hmm. for myself, but this isn't about me, mm -hmm. you know, it's about democracy and yes. it's about the people. Yes. So people just need to pay attention. I think that that's the, the number one lesson. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to pay attention and see what their elected 
representatives are doing. Yeah. And if they don't like it, or even if they do like it, whatever your position, you need to communicate as well okay. with your um, elected people to let them know what you think. Yes. You can't represent someone without knowing what they want. I think it was pretty clear what the people wanted this yes. time, though. Yeah, it was. So, the, you know, it's up to the people to decide how do they want to go forward in their own area mm -hmm. and to support people they want to represent, represent them. Represent them, yeah. The NAACP has recently come out against fake sample ballots. Is there anything that you can do on a county level to address this misinformation to voters? You know... I agree with the issue generally, but mm -hmm. I think that the problem is money. Mm -hmm. And we have, like, on the train, eventually one day, coming to Prince George's County, public financing. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make the difference. Because the reason why sample ballots are powerful yes. is because it's a way candidates can pull money and put their information out to the public that's mm -hmm. cheaper for them. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what... The whole thing is about right yes and traditionally in our county it's been the senators who have kind of led that train mm -hmm. and whoever they chose to put on their ballot had a better chance of winning mm -hmm. but these days more people have gotten access to word processing cool things and they can kind of come up with their own sample ballot yeah. that often look pretty much like the ones that the senators are putting out mm -hmm. so then you end up five or ten different sample ballots coming in your mail and nobody knows what they mean mm -hmm. and you know depending on which one you have in your hand on the way into the poll mm -hmm. you might already know who you're going to vote for for governor but mm -hmm. maybe you didn't know that the school board candidate was on that list mm -hmm. and so you might just automatically look at whatever sample ballot and just vote for that person absolutely and i think the problem is um those candidates just don't have money to run mm -hmm. and so it's just easier or cheaper for them to be on sample ballots mm -hmm. but if we can just get the public financing and I believe it should be in place it got kicked down the road by the last council mm -hmm. so hopefully can you explain that what, what, it, what is um, public financing explain that in the well of the way it's working right now for in the state of Maryland for example mm -hmm. um, when Larry Hogan ran the first time he used public financing Wow uh-huh so for every certain number of dollars say fifty dollars that you raise from someone mm -hmm. then the the government gives him like four hundred more dollars wow so the fifty dollars you give him becomes four hundred and fifty dollars mm -hmm. it's like close to that mm -hmm. right so um, the average person can have a big impact on elections because the average person maybe can give you fifty dollars it might be a, a deep dig mm -hmm. but they can't give you five hundred dollars or they can't give you a thousand dollars but the exponential increase in the amount of money you can get with the public financing because the the government the taxpayers put in a match to some whatever that ratio is mm -hmm. so um, Larry Hogan was able to win governor in the state of Maryland using public financing you know that's the the problem with money is that sometimes there are people or businesses that think well, I've given you X amount of money. Mm -hmm. Like, aren't you going to vote my way? Aren't you mm -hmm. going to do what I want? You're not beholden to people if they haven't given you money mm -hmm. or if they've given you 50 bucks. Come on, people, mm -hmm. right? So um, in any event, I, I, I know that I, I will not name who the company was, but I once had a bill that I put in and they didn't like. And they came to me and they said, we just gave you $500. And I was like... And you wanted somebody else to win? Like, mm -hmm. I thought you gave me money because you thought I was doing a yeah. good job. Mm -hmm. Not because you're trying to buy me for yeah. some position. Yeah. So, what made you leave from serving as the chair of the House delegates to the county council seat? Well, there was this four-year gap where I was out of office because I had run for lieutenant governor mm -hmm. and with Doug Gansler, and he lost. So, therefore... I was out of office for four mm -hmm. years, which was fine. I did other things, and um, you know, I started a small company. Um, it was um, community relations kind of a company, and I had some really great clients who paid well for a few years, and then, bam, everything went downhill. So <laughs> I was grateful that I was able to get a job with Prince George's Parks and Rec 
mm -hmm. and which was also a great experience for me because it exposed me to the strangest thing, food trucks. <laughs> One of the things I had to do as part of my job was to book food trucks mm -hmm. for big events that I was planning. Mm -hmm. And man, it was hard to find food <laughs> trucks in Prince George's County yeah. because there weren't very many that mm -hmm. were registered here because, or licensed here because we have terrible food truck laws <laughs> or had. Really? They're getting oh, better. Okay. Yeah, so because it's really hard to make a living here on your food truck, people don't come here. They'd rather go to D.C. or Montgomery County or anywhere else where mm -hmm. they can make more money. Why come here when there's no place you can sell? Mm. Wow, I so, didn't know that. Yeah, so when I um, joined the county council, one of the things I wanted to do, I know it's not the, the biggest issue out there in the world, mm -hmm. but I wanted to fix that both for the food trucks and for the community. Yes. And so uh, Danielle Glaros had already started the process and she had made them at least be legal in the county, but the way she had to do it was so convoluted, it was just too hard mm -hmm. to truly work smoothly. And so I started going about trying to improve the laws and we have gotten them better. Like right now, for example, municipalities, if mm -hmm. they want food trucks, have food trucks. Wow, awesome. How do you want to do them? Up to you. You know, where do you want to allow them? Whatever. Mm -hmm. What Can you explain to our viewers, what is the maglev train? And are you against it for Prince George's County? I am against it in mm -hmm. Prince George's County because the way the maglev train is uh, being planned, mm -hmm. it would kind of tunnel through and even above ground through our county, mm -hmm. and there'd be no stop here. So with no stop in the county, there's no economic development that comes around it. Mm -hmm. And there's, it decreases the usefulness for it, for mm -hmm. people in the county. You'd have to drive all the way, way into DC just to get on it. Mm -hmm. And then it costs so much, most of us can't afford to use it. Mm -hmm. And so they tell you, well, it's gonna save all of this, you know, pollution and cars on the road. How many of those people are really taking a car on mm -hmm. the road? If you have enough money to take the maglev, you're probably taking the train anyway, or you're mm -hmm. t flying or something. Yes, you're yes. not somebody who's driving yourself to New York, all right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I just don't see it being this great big improvement over anything, mm -hmm. and it's certainly not an improvement for our county. It'll be really bad for the areas that are it's being built through during the time it's being built, which look at what's happening with the Purple Line, with the mm -hmm. delays. Yeah. It's a real problem for people, whether it's a business that's affected mm -hmm. because your business is, is being blocked or it's harder to get to, mm -hmm. or it's your home and you're having to navigate around a construction site forever, it feels mm -hmm. like, right? Very so, true. you know, we want the Purple Line, at least mm -hmm. we get a benefit once it's built. Yeah. But to live through that kind of disruption and for what? to yeah. not get any benefit out of it does not seem like a good plan to me. I, I agree, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Where, where is that process at right now, though? At the moment, it is paused. Mm -hmm. There have been some, uh, you know, bureaucratic things along the way mm -hmm. that have paused the project, and I just hope that our federal partners, you know, meaning mm -hmm. our congressmen mm -hmm. and senators, mm -hmm. can um, get involved and just make it clear that we, we don't want it here. What can we do as citizens? Uh, as citizens, county? you call your congressman, mm -hmm. you call your senator, you email them and say, I'm against this and mm -hmm. here's why. Thank you for advocating for us on that. Yeah. You know, that of course. I, I, you informed me of some stuff I didn't know about mm -hmm. as it regards to MAGLAF, so thank you for that. Yeah, I know that Anthony Brown has stated that he is against it. Mm -hmm. So that's been good. And, um, you know, we want to kind of keep up that kind of representation. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, why has it been such a challenge to get public transportation in dry spots in the county, like within uh, my city, like Upper Marlboro? What do you mean dry? Uh, transportation, like oh, okay. uh, in areas that really don't have any transportation. The closest metro yeah. to me is Branch Avenue, and yeah. there's no bus to even get to Branch Avenue metro right. station, so you have to have a car, or you got to pay for an Uber. Right, so. right, right. No, it's a problem, and I know that the bus, you know, is something yeah. we need to expand. Yes. And what's um, been the challenges surrounding that, though? Why, it's it's why money. It? It's always money. Okay. And when I was chair of the delegation, um, one thing we negotiated for was like 
five extra million dollars to expand bus service in the southern part of the county. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that was not benefiting me because my district was not down there, but mm -hmm. I understood that, you know, you have to have good things for everybody. Yeah. And people in the southern part of the county not having access to public transportation is not good. Yes. And um, we also need to make sure we get that whole um, 210 kind of corridor taken care of mm -hmm. and, and have the high speed kind of some kind of train go through um, down to Charles County because mm -hmm. yes. we're getting so much traffic people going down there just let them get on the train and zoop, zip them up yes. and clear off the road and mm -hmm. yeah that's yes. what we need I, or I even the um, the the bus rapid transit mm -hmm. system. Very cool. Yeah, I think we we could use that. You know, put that in a lot faster and cheaper. Awesome, awesome. And I also think that that ties into the problem with our school bus shortages. You know, if we could, you know, tie in some public transportation to help out with that issue. Right. It would. Shayla Adam Stafford. She yes. recommended that. Yes. And I 100% support that idea. I'm I'm with you and her on that too. She mm -hmm. let me know that that was something she was advocating for. I was like. Why don't we do that? <laughs> but I think the reason we don't, for one, is because we don't even have enough buses for the average citizen without mm -hmm. adding children on the school bus, mm -hmm. I mean, on those buses. But, you know, it'd be a great way to kind of do double duty. Yeah. Are you still a part of the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee? You know, during COVID, all of the committees got kind of wiped out. Wow. Okay. So what we've been doing is meeting as Committee of the Whole. Mm -hmm. meaning that everybody is on every committee okay. and it's more time consuming mm -hmm. and it's, I, I don't think that it's really the best way I think really do think it's better to have smaller committees that you can really delve into an issue because when you have 11 people asking questions yeah. each hearing would take so long you just feel a pressure not to ask a question yes so I try to listen to my colleagues to see what the answers are that we're already getting mm -hmm. before I need to hear the sound of my own voice mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, just to try to keep the meeting shorter but I do think that we could get um, more information on issues if we had the committees again mm -hmm. but you know COVID just has not made that easy for the staff or mm -hmm. for any one. So, so are you revisiting that? Well, I mean, we're going to go back in person at some point, mm -hmm. and so I'm sure that the committees will come back then. Okay. Yeah. With um, But it's up to the chair. Yeah. Shelters for homeless families have been an issue within the county. We have one shelter for homeless families, and if your son is 15 years old, he's not allowed to come into the shelter with right. you. Is this an issue that you are looking to address? Do you have any recommendations surrounding the assistance of our homeless community um, since you were a part of that committee? Yeah, the thing that does exist, fortunately, is Promise Place, mm -hmm. which is located in the downstairs of uh, Shepherd's Cove. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that is a better situation with them there mm -hmm. because let's say something happened, you know, some years ago and I've got all these boys mm -hmm. and, if, and if I needed to go into a shelter, mm -hmm. um, the older ones would not be able to go into the shelter with me. And what, mm -hmm. what was going to happen to them? Yeah. 15, 16 year old kid, what are they going to do? Yeah. So at least now they can go into Promise Place, which mm -hmm. is downstairs. And that's a, uh, a place solely for the boys? It's, well, it's for young people, up okay. to, yeah, boys and girls, okay. up to age 24. Mm. And um, they do an amazing job, and I think we all need to do more to support Promise Place. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that exists, but we need more shelter space generally. Mm -hmm. And we, we really need to make shelter unnecessary because people have homes. Yes. And so the more we can do to find ways to, to put people in homes, the better. Mm -hmm. Some of the homeless people um, have mental health issues, yes. you know, and that's a problem. Um, can be difficult to deal with. Um, Fox 5 reported last night that Prince George's County homicide number is at a 14 year high. What are some things that the county council are looking to do to address the increase in violence and crime within the county with the state in a def I'm sorry, answer that and then I'll move on. 
Well, the um, the problem with the the crime is it's you know, the violent crime is what you're talking about yes. has increased. It's it's bad across the country. It's yeah. not in just in Prince George's County, mm -hmm. and we don't live in a bubble. So yeah. whatever's happening in the world with COVID, with whatever, it has affected everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, in reality, our numbers, you know, you'd have to say it like this, not as bad as D.C. Mm. No, very true. <laughs> right? Yes. D.C. Yes. has um, a smaller population. They have a, they're about two-thirds the size of Prince George's County, mm -hmm. but their um, crime is like, double or something no, right you're right you're right so things are a lot worse there so i think in reality we're doing a decent job here in the county especially if you consider what our budget is mm -hmm. our budget is one quarter of dc's mm -hmm. and we have a third more people mm -hmm. so i think we're actually doing a pretty good job and um now as far as violent crime goes one violent crime is one too many yes and so people who are committing these crimes, uh, whatever services that they need, whatever attention that they need, we need to make sure they get it before they commit the crime. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what happens to people. I don't know if it's all, it's like it's such a wide variety of reasons people commit crimes. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. They are truly need whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They have anger management issues. Mm -hmm. They have access to firearms. Mm -hmm. You know, all the things that kind of can come together. And if it, you can't even just increase the number of police and expect that that's going to solve the problem. That was going to be my next point. You know, there is yeah. a shortage. So do you think that that is contributing to the issue? No, because we had the same shortage a couple of years ago when mm -hmm. crime was down. So yeah. I don't think that the number of police officers necessarily mm -hmm. um, has an impact. Unless the police officer is right there, yeah. th then, you know, the police can't be everywhere. Yeah. And people just need to know how to act. I agree. <laughs> so, Thank you. And Thank that you. always, all the way starts back with the home, like I've said mm -hmm. before. We need to start with people who are struggling and help them yes. from the time, the, the, at the beginning of their lives and not wait till, you know, they're 18 or 19, mm -hmm. you know? I agree. Mm -hmm. What um, would you say is the top three needs for your constituents and how will you address them? Well, the, the calls that I got the most of during COVID were about um, needing help with unemployment. Mm -hmm. I mean, our state unemployment system has been really difficult mm -hmm. and it's had a profound impact on people's lives mm -hmm. and you know how can you make it if you don't even get unemployment payments for months and months and months and months how can you make it i couldn't make it i couldn't either no yeah. you know and we're we're you know doing well in our lives but if we lost our jobs mm -hmm. and we apply for unemployment and they just constantly had questions and wouldn't help you. I mm -hmm. mean, so that's number one. Then the next thing people need help with as a result of that, mostly, is they're not able to pay their rent. Yeah. And if you can't pay your rent, I mean, we don't even have the protections in place that keep you from being evicted at this point. Mm -hmm. And of course, even the apartment building owners have to pay their rent yeah. <laughs> or their, their mortgage, mm -hmm. right? So it's a, it's a domino effect, but people, need help with getting even the, the rent assistance, which is taking, I mean, I think the county is doing a decent job at getting it out, yeah. but not a perfect job. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be perfect. No mm -hmm. one's perfect. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the landlords, when they, and this is one thing that's helped, when we changed it from just having each individual apply and to have the landlords be able to apply on mm -hmm. behalf of the tenants, mm -hmm. that's helped a lot because they're, they're professionals. Mm -hmm. They have time and energy and they understand the process and so they're, they're going to turn in their paperwork right. Yeah. Whereas an individual might miss some form or not mm -hmm. check some box or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then their payments are delayed. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we do still have money from the federal government mm -hmm. that can help with rent. But mm -hmm. if, if, um, you know, if we can't get it out to people fast enough, yeah. then they end up on the street. So yes. that's that's a real problem. Yes. And of course, you know, every time that there's a food giveaway, you see the food just goes like crazy. Yes. Yeah, my family was uh, helping. We did a food giveaway um, last Saturday mm -hmm. and we gave out 
350 turkeys. Wow. And 300 boxes of, you know, of um, produce. And mm -hmm. How will you exhibit and encourage peace and shared leadership between you and your colleagues on the board? What, on the county council? Yes. Well, you know, I, I think that it's important for each of us to put more emphasis on what the people want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the people's council. It's not my seat, mm -hmm. right? It's the people in District 5, mm -hmm. wherever they live now. <laughs> yeah. It's their seat, mm -hmm. and they have a right to hold me accountable. And I have a right to, like, talk to my colleagues, but, you know, we all have to be willing to talk to each other. Yes. And remember that we're working on behalf of the citizens, mm -hmm. not for our own personal agendas. Yes. So... You know, we just each need to do our job, and mm -hmm. and and then there will be peace. Amen. Amen. Um, are you running against anyone, or are you the only one running for um, this District 5 seat? The last I checked, I was the only one who had registered. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that I'll be the only one who's filed by February 22nd. Mm -hmm. You know, I hope not. I hope I don't have anyone file against me. Everybody <laughs> wants to be unopposed. <laughs> That would be cool. That's, that's human nature. Yeah. <laughs> but, and it happens because, it you know, here's the thing. On the Prince George's County Council, we have term limits. You get two terms, and if, if, you're, um, if you don't run for an at-large seat, which you, is another two terms, mm -hmm. that's it. So most people, they see, okay, you won this time. Okay, I won't challenge you next time. <laughs> and then I'll just run, a, run for the seat when you're term limited. Yeah. And that's kind of how it has worked. So mm -hmm. not a lot of people get challenged. Mm -hmm. And then knowing that you can't um, run for it again, I think that that can, can put a, a frame on our situation where um, the current council member, just like by the time you hit that point, you realize, well, I don't have to listen to them anymore because they can't hurt me. They can't vote me out so dangerous and we've seen that on the county council so i believe that and i've always been against term limits because of that mm -hmm. you know but because you don't have any reason other than your own moral compass to um to represent your constituents mm -hmm. because you know you can't really like most people aren't going to run against you when it's time for reelect, mm -hmm. and then with well, not a reasonable person who could actually beat you yeah. that it's hard to find credible candidates willing to go through all that when they could just wait four more years when it's an open seat. Yeah. So in any event, I think that term limits aren't the best, but that's not because I would plan to could keep running for it. Mm -hmm. I was two terms on the, on the, uh, in the House of Delegates and mm -hmm. was willing to do something else. Mm -hmm. I'll have two terms here, and I'll have to think about whether I want to uh, run at large or go be a grandma or whatever my life holds at that point. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and I, I plan to continue to represent my constituents mm -hmm. and to um, not be someone who discounts their views. Mm -hmm. So that's my plan. Well, you know what I want you to run for. So <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll keep that between us. I but love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last but not least, this is probably the most difficult question that I'm going to ask you today. Okay. Where can they go to find out information on you? <laughs> Google. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. That's where I went. Right. But, I mean, I have JoleneIvy.com. J-O-L-E-N-E-I-V-E-Y. Don't forget the E and Ivy. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, there's information there. But, you know, there's information just easily. You just go to Google.com and put mm -hmm. in Jolene Ivy. I'm mm -hmm. just pretty much only me. <laughs> yeah, she's right. So I'm easy. It's not like somebody with a, a very standard name mm -hmm. that it'd be harder to kind of sift through and even know who you're looking for. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time for educating. You know, you just educated and you spoke truth to power. So thank you so much for everything. No, thanks for yeah. having me, Alexis. Of course, of course. Thank Appreciate you. you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.